There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 1027, January 15th, 2024, Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say hasta la vista at Haas. Gunter is gone. Toto is a keeper. In the goodie bag, we have Nikita, the latest Florida hurricane. We shall explain, gladly. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, Toto signs for another three years with Mercedes. Gunther Steiner is fired. Two-time Turkish rally champion Volkan Isik takes victory in the opening round of the 2024 Clio Cup Ice Trophy. And the W15 is in the simulator, ladies and gentlemen. And this week's interview, USF Pro 2000 driver Nikita Johnson. Nasser will have all the details. We have a special guest this week from Grand Prix 247.com. They will share their opinions, insights into the 2024 Formula One season and just a reminder ladies and gentlemen we do need your contributions to keep this program on the air just click on the support f1 weekly tab you know you want to and i want to thank dan wardman thank you very much nas welcome to the studio so i know you were a big gunther steiner fan i hope you're doing well well i'm doing well thank you but i am still recovering from the shocking news that Gunther Steiner has left the building at Haas F1. The Italian stallion of Netflix Drive to Survive did play an important part in Gene Haas adding F1 team to his portfolio to a NASCAR team, which is a rare combination. It was through his connection at Ferrari that the team was able to secure Ferrari engines and all the -the off-the-shelf items allowed by rules and regulations. And, you know, this was not Gunther Steiner's first rodeo in motorsports. According to Craig Slater of Sky F1, Steiner was made aware of this last month, and this has now been confirmed by Steiner himself. His contract was up for renewal, and Gene decided not to renew it and promoted technical director I.O. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name correct. Last name is Kamatsu. Normally, in such cases, there is a two-way lovey-dovey press release, but the Haas statement did not include any comments from Gunther Steiner. As we all know, Mr. Rogers, motor racing is a performance-based business. You can be the star on Netflix and Metro Gordon Mayer, but if the team is performing like a sick and dying lion, the hunter becomes the hunted. I am sure there is more to the story than what we know at this stage, Perhaps, I'm assuming, perhaps Gunther, using his usual flowery language, did what uh, Paul Tracy did at Penske Racing, telling Roger how to run his team, is not going to work. Gene may have responded the same way as Henry Ford II, who once told Lee Ayakoka, my name is on the building. In Gene's case, his name is also on the car. Now, Gene uh, Haas initially spoke to Lawrence Barreto of Formula One, and he said, and I quote, and this is from FormulaOne.com website, it came down to performance. Here we are in our eighth year, over 160 races. We have never had a podium. The last couple of years, we've been 10th or 9th, end quote. Now, you know, there are um, two sides to every story. I will not be surprised if one day, 
Sooner or later we listened to uh, Gunther Steiner and he said, Gene is a wanker because he would not put any money into the team. And But he did make an interest. He was at the Autosport show in Birmingham, England, and he made a statement. I don't want to comment on his statement, but the comment was, now that he's gone, he doesn't care about Haas F1. Your thoughts on this, senor? I mean, I sort of agree with Gene Haas. It is performance-oriented. Formula One is brutal, and if there's no performance, you must be gotten rid of, really. I mean, that's the standard procedure, folks. And this happens all the time. Now, I do agree he was a colorful character and did make the Netflix series that much better. But in the end, Gene's throwing quite a bit of money at this. And he would like to see some NASCAR-like results. So, uh, I'm not surprised. And I, I think, in retrospect, Gunther will will have to agree that there's just not enough performance at the factory and everywhere else. So you have to start at the top. I think you just have to be realistic. And I don't know about Komatsu, but it could be a dreary, painful season for them now. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Gunter came to Haas F1 two years before the team made their debut in 2016 and scored points in their very first race in Albert Park when Romain Grosjean finished sixth. I think it was in his second or third time that Roman scored point. He was just like totally elated. And at the end of the season, the team finished eighth in the Constructors' Championship ahead of Reb, Renault and Sauber, which is pretty good. You know, these teams have been there for a long time. Their best season was 2018 when they finished fifth in the Constructors' Championship, which is very impressive for an independent team in only their third season in the Piranha Pool. But in two of the last three seasons, they finished dead last, and that's really not good. In between, there was the rich energy sponsorship fiasco, the Russian roulette with Dmitry Mazepin, and dumping uh, one of the biggest last names in Formula One, as was the case with Mick Schumacher. And I, not that I'm a fan of Mick Schumacher or anybody, but uh, I always thought that keeping Schumacher was going to be very beneficial in lending sponsorship, but they had a hard time even getting that. But so, like I said earlier, I'm sure there's a lot more to the story. Haas F1 gets a lot of flack for not hiring American drivers. It has been mentioned by more than one racing personality that Gene Haas, who is no longer interested in pouring more money into his F1 team, should really enjoy a nice payday and sell his team to Michael Andretti. But he has responded by saying, I did not come into Formula 1 to get out. And Michael, you know, he has the money and the desire to take care of unfinished business in Formula 1. And you said about Mr. Komatsu, uh, he's Japanese, as we all know. And he started out at Bar Honda. I think he was a tire engineer first and then moved on to um, other duties. And he has been with uh, Haas since they got into Formula 1 racing 2016. So he's been around for a while, and I'm sure he knows what he's doing. But uh, we'll see how this thing um, works out. But wait, there's more. Before Steiner's story broke out, news came. Haas's, I believe, this was the guy who designed the car. Simone Resta is leaving. He is an experienced and respected engineer. He came to Haas F1 from their engine supplier, Ferrari. Maybe, and that's report is that he's going to go back there. And I'm thinking maybe... Gene Haas is on the Laura Rossi program of Alpine fame. Firing experienced people will bring success. But obviously, you know, Kaka rolls downhill. Gunter has to accept responsibility. But I don't, you know, he did not design the car today. And if you want to get a good designer, you need to throw some more money. So let's see. Uh, I, I don't think this team is going to finish sixth or seventh in the championship. They're going to be. And this is despite the fact, I mean, if they were floundering with uh, Mick Schumacher and Dimitri Mazepin, Mazepin, you can point the fingers to the drivers, but you can't point the fingers to drivers they have, Nico Hulkenberg and uh, uh, the ballsy guy, Mr. Kevin Magnussen. What say you? No, I think they have a great 
driver lineup. That's certainly not the problem, but there is no reinvestment in the team by Gene Haas. And I think Gene expected that they should be close to Ferrari, being that it's a copy of the Ferrari with Ferrari parts. But that isn't always the case. The car needs to be set up. You need good engineering and mechanics to do that. And you need a great leader. So, obviously, he wants to stick around. Let's see. Uh, he's going to have to pick somebody with more experience than Camazzo, I believe. But we'll see how the year begins. Indeed. Who knows, maybe some other team will hope, you know, you know what will help them if two other teams come up with the zero side concept and then find them oopsie were four seconds slower than max. That might make them look good. But looking good at the, at the cost of somebody else's misery is not the way to move forward. But you know, we're going to find out. We're not too far away from testing. Okay, sir, now we move on to the goodie bag of the week. One young man who is on the road to success with loads of talent is Florida Fresh and subject of this week's Faces Going Places. This is amazing. Talk about a resume builder. On to the front straightaway. Folks, he won in Texas, and he's a winner on the Pacific Northwest as well. Nikita Johnson winning the final race of the 2023 USF Pro Championship season here in Portland. Johnson victorious over Salvador de Alba. What a run for Nikita. So impressive. Nikita Johnson is a young, serious talent from FLA. I have been in touch with his father, Obi, for a few months while Nikita was testing in Europe. His racing achievements are very impressive, but more importantly, so is his down-to-earth personality. And I was really very impressed how uh, decent and polite he is. My thanks to both of them for their time, and we will definitely be following his career very closely. His first race will be on the streets of uh, St. Petersburg, along with the IndyCar race. And I hope members of F1 Weekly Familiar enjoy his conversation, and please do check out his website, and his, most of his racing is on YouTube, and it's very, very impressive for this young man. So here is Nikita Johnson. Okay, folks, I'm here in Tampa with the next high-speed Florida hurricane, Nikita Johnson. Young man, good to meet you. How are you today? Very good. It's nice and sunny here down in Florida. Very excited for this interview. Speaking of sunny, you are from Sunshine State and named after an ice hockey player. What's the story here? We always liked hockey, and hockey was going to be the sport that I was going to play when I grew up, and then we just kind of got into racing by accident. And what was the accident? Um, my mom went to BMW dealership to go uh, get service on her car and one of the guys there said that there's a track nearby because I had a race car seat when I was like maybe three or four and later we saw that it was an actual real track not a rental car place and I just hopped into one and ever since then I've loved racing. Now, you have exploded on the American racing scene. How did you catch the racing fever? Just as soon as I stepped in a kid cart, it all went from there. And I just love motorsports so much that ever since I've been a baby, I've always watched F1 or IndyCar. And that really ignited a flame inside me for my passion for motorsports and just cars in general. Florida is home to Daytona and NASCAR. What's your interest in cars racing and turning right and left and not ovals? I think both take a uh, different skill set. NASCAR is very hard. It's completely different racing, but just open wheels more my style of racing. And I, I really love endurance racing. So at some point, I can see myself in a GT car or maybe a prototype car when I'm older. Uh, tell us about your karting days and major achievements. I started when I was five in kid kart, went in micro, won everything in the United States in Rock Cup. Then I went overseas in Mini. I was factory driver for Energy, Parallel, Race for Baby Race. Had some good results there. Came back over to the United States, did some junior stuff, and just hopped into cars early because why not? How was your experience in the European karting scene? And tell us uh, your favorite tracks there, karting tracks. And how was the depth of competition compared to karting scene in the U.S.? Just it, the karting scene in Italy was a lot more professional and 
it's there is so many great drivers from all around the world, and that's where everybody came to race, um, no matter where they're from. And just it was very cool to meet a bunch of different types of people. Um, my favorite tracks was Adria, South Garda, La Conca, and yeah, just the level of competition was so much higher. The racing was a lot tougher. You always had your elbows out. If you left the door open, you'd get freight trained by 10 cars, unlike in the States. And it was just a very unique few years and very fun. Uh, what are your big achievements or best memories from karting competition, both here and overseas? Um, just racing with my dad. He was always there. My mom, even my little brother. When we're all there as a family doing it, that's what really mattered. Um, to me, it's a family sport, so I love it when everybody's there. Especially when I win, that's probably the biggest achievements, but I can't really say which one because they're all good. Among your com competitors from karting scene, uh, who are some of the drivers who are in single-seaters and doing well these days, like yourself? Kimi Annanelli, uh, Gabrielle Mini, Taylor Barnard, Nikita Bedrin. Um, all those drivers I've known since I went over there. Some of them I didn't race against, but some of them I've known pretty well. But yeah, I mean, very cool to see how we race together in go-karts and how they're different types of style of racing or they're different paths um, in form of open wheels. In 2022, you were third in U.S. Formula Juniors. How quick uh, were you able to? How quickly were you able to adjust to single seaters, and what was the biggest challenge? It took me a few days, of course, just to get used to it. Um, I was fast right away, but just a bit scared because you know I'm in a car that costs maybe quadruple of what a go kart would be, so I didn't want to wreck. But one of the big things was I was always little maybe like 100 pounds, so hitting the brake pedal was always hard and turning the car, but once I grew up a little bit, just everything became easier, but just very thankful for the opportunity to get into cars early. And between karting and now, have you ever employed a driver coach? Yes, way back then I worked with Alex Speed and Micro. Um, throughout the years, I've had a few friends uh, coach me. Most of the time, the team gets a driver coach, like Dakota Dickerson or Callan O'Keefe. So I always love all of them, of course, and just very thankful for all the good driver coaches I've had. Now, it's very well known that racing drivers are very strong-headed uh, guys. They have to be. Uh, when you are being coached by a driver, and let's say a dri coach says something that you are not comfortable with or it's not your style, uh, how long it takes to listen to them? I would say right away. I'm not the person to decline somebody's opinion. If I have a different opinion or view on it, I'll just have a normal conversation with them about it. Usually I'll listen or I might take his idea and put my own little spin on it or try something a tiny bit different. But I'm open to everybody's opinions or suggestions, so I'm always open all ears. Oh, that's pretty cool. Last year you moved to a USF Pro 2000, right? And won two, race two of the opening uh, round in St. Pete after leading the most laps. Uh, success so early in the season in a new series. Was this a pleasant surprise or pre-planned? It was pre-planned. We were fast always in juniors and then and then going into the 2000, we were fast in some preseason testing. So we knew we were going to do well. The team was good. And, you know, the driver was good, of course. So we knew that we'd get some uh, good races and points. We just didn't know it would be the first round. But, of course, it was great to start off the season with a win in my hometown. And then it was a little bit rough after that. But we always managed to score good points, and we pulled off with Vice Champion. When you go to a new track um, that you have never tested on, how long it takes to learn the track? So before I go to the new track, I go and do some sim just to get used to the track, what gears. I'll go watch onboard on YouTube about other drivers that were there. But when I get to the track, I already know all the gears, all the corners, where to break. So it only takes me about a few laps, maybe two or three, and then I can start pushing.
Now, you had eight podiums, which gave you second place in the championship ahead of Lockie Hughes. Very impressive. How would you rate your season on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being best? I think it was a 9, 8 or 9. I could have done some stuff to improve, but for me, as long as I'm moving forward and I'm gaining more knowledge, that's a plus to me. Um, I'm not trying to be the next superstar of tomorrow. I'm just trying to be the best I can be and learn as much as possible before I get put in the spotlight. In Austin, you jumped into USF Pro 2000 car and again won on your debut weekend. I've noticed you adapt very quickly to bigger machines. Is this pure natural talent or have you done secret extensive testing? Um, that was actually my first time in the car. I tested the old car about two years before that, just for fun, but that was my first time in that car, uh, about my second day. So I'm just, I think it's a natural talent of how you can adapt to the car, and I'm very good at adapting to new cars or changing conditions, so I always love a fun challenge. I love the Circuit of America track in Austin. Um, how do you like it as far as the layout of the track is concerned? I think it's one of my favorite tracks. You have a lot of runoff, of course, so you can't make any too big of mistakes. But just amazing for racing because you have the S's that you'll have a lot of aero wash in, and then you have the long back straightaway, and then some other technical corners. So for me, it's almost a perfect track. It's probably one of my favorite tracks in the U.S. Uh, tell us about your racing testing adventures in Europe, tracks and types of cars you drove. So last winter, 2023, I drove GB3 at Monza, uh, Red Bull Ring, Barcelona, Valencia, oh yeah, Aragon, um, Nottington Park. A bit, time just gone by way too fast, so sometimes forget about what I did, but um, it was very fun learn the car more so very comfortable with the car did a lot of wet weather testing it was just very fun to have the opportunity to go test in europe and to learn the car it's it's always a good day when you can drive a car monza is my all-time favorite track and always will be uh, what's your thought on that track and the atmosphere there it's probably one of my favorite tracks in europe of course, it's an F1 track, so it's very special always to be on F1 track, but at the end of the day, it's another track. Um, we did most of it was wet weather, a little bit of dry, but it's probably one of my favorites because the straights are so long, and then I also just love Italy a lot. Just when I go over there and I can eat as much pasta as I want or pizza, it's just it's amazing because I love food. Great. Okay, I understand you will have a very busy uh, 2024 season racing on both sides of the pond. Give us a little bit of uh, information what you're planning to do in teams. So I'll be doing USF Pro 2000 with VRD over in the States. And then when I turn 16, I'll be in GB3 and British F3 starting at Spa when I turn 16. So that'll be fun. I'm up for the challenge always like I did in COTA and Portland so June July will be very busy we have four weeks straight over and back over and back so we'll just see how it goes we have uh, it's going to be very exciting who is your favorite in Formula 1 both in terms of driver and teams I think Max Verstappen is one of my favorite he's just you know he of course he's winning right now but just I've watched him ever since like maybe 2016 or 2015 when he got in there and then I also really like Luna Norris and Carlos Sainz just because I think they're funny and you know they worked well together when they're in McLaren but I don't know I think most of the F1 drivers I really like just because I have a passion for the sport and I don't really particularly hate anyone because they're all they all love the sport and they're doing it for the same reason as me now, Florida has produced some good talents um, over the years. Uh, Logan Sargent is from here, Kyle Kirkwood, Oliver Askew. Um, do you know these people? Are you friends with them? Yeah, some friends with Oliver Askew and Kyle Kirkwood. I don't know Logan Sargent. I know of him, but he's uh, did a lot of European stuff and in go-karts he raced in Europe. But it would be pretty cool to meet him at some point. But, yeah, I mean, I think Florida produces a lot of talent. We had Ocala Grand Prix back then, and a lot of the 
Floridian talent has come out of there or raced there. So I think just where we're at, and we always have a lot of wet weather. Now the most important question, what is your ETA in the Padana Pool Car Formula One? Maybe 20, 20, uh, 2027, um, 2028, I'm not exactly sure yet, but we just hope to do all in British F3, show that I deserve to be on the grid, and then after that, everything should fall into place. I can't control the outcome, I can just only control how I drive, and for that reason I'm going to do the best I can. I know people will take a big interest part of the way, so... I can't say when I'll be there, I just know I will be there. And uh, will you please tell our listeners, that we have listeners all over the world, something about yourself, what from the racing driver, what kind of music you like, what kind of food you like, and general stuff, and what other sports you follow apart from motor racing? Um, so I like to cook a lot, that's probably one of my big passions besides racing. I love like 70s to 90s rock. Um, some 2000s alternative. I love all types of foods. I love trying new foods. I love um, rock climbing, swimming, fishing, spear fishing. Um, I'm big. Really love to watch rock, like rock climbing competitions and hockey. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Nikita. Thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. Back to you, Nasser. Okay, sir, now we come to bromance between Valtteri, this is James, and Toto Wolf Extended. Williams to be powered by Mercedes till 2030. So they won't be inviting Porsche or Toyota or Hyundai to their uh, uh, base. So that's for, that's another one ticked off. Okay, Mr. Uh, James Wall said, and I quote, we have enjoyed a long-term partnership with Mercedes-Benz and we are thrilled to extend this collaboration into the next era of Formula One. The expertise, support and technology that Mercedes brings to the table align perfectly with our team's aspirations in the medium and long term." End quote. And we have more of the same. Earlier, McLaren also extended their power supply agreement with the shining star of Stuttgart. Lately, the star has run out of luck. They certainly need a lot of oomph and some of that farfetch nougat from BW to take the fight to MV and RB. Now, 2012 was the last time Williams was pasteurized with victory, and to this day, they remain one of the most successful Formula One teams of all times, and also McLaren, but they did get one win uh, through the smiling assassin at Monza, which was very good. And let's hope we can see both teams start winning races again in our lifetime. What are your prospects, sir, for the season for McLaren and Williams? I, I think Mil Williams will take a few steps forward. McLaren will take one big, giant leap forward. But, you know, really, the smiling face of Toto is going to dominate testing, the beginning. All eyes are going to be on Lewis's face. Is he frowning? Or is he giggling after a few laps and gets back into the pits? That is the photograph we are all waiting for. Very true. And it will be great to have some serious competition. And I think drivers like Lewis, Alonso, Max, and Charles Leclerc can really provide the very best in racing tools. But I think at the end of the season, we, I think we all know who the world champion will be. And, you know, because catching up to giving Max a car, the way he's going, his age and talent, of course, immense talent. Mercedes or whoever, they need to give Lewis a car. It doesn't have to be half a second faster, but at least I would say minimum 0.2 to 0.3 faster than Red Bull. Because, you know, if you have a car that is just as competitive as Red Bull, he will do to Lewis and whoever is trying to win a race what he did to Sebastian Vettel at uh, Mon Mexico City some years ago. Do you remember when Seb was in Ferrari? Indeed. So that's uh, one driver I want to talk about because now I saw a report that uh, Alexander Albon was approached by two teams and Williams did not uh, release him. You know, he is a very good racing talent, otherwise he would not be in Formula 1. But I think it's just one of those things, you know, be careful what you wish for. 
just might come true. I think he's going to look very good as long as he does not become teammate to Max, Lewis, or uh, Machismo. And uh, we'll, we'll see how it pans out when he gets into a more... Uh, obviously, if you put him in the best car, he's going to win races. But I remember when he was in uh, GP2 slash Formula 2, he was uh, beaten by, you know, some of the guys who are in Formula 1 today. So it's a tough road to get to the top of Formula 1. And as far as Williams' team is concerned, you know, they're keeping Logan Sargent, which is good. Uh, do I expect them to be in the top five on a regular basis? I don't think so. Do I expect McLaren to be in the top five or top three on a regular basis? I think so. Your take on uh, Mr. Elbon and his... Uh, Crusade to get to the top. Albon looks great because of Sargent. So, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, he's great. I mean, he, some of his qualifying... No, he's a good good race car driver, but, you know, I, I think everybody on the grid is a good race car driver. What we need is machismo -ness. Oh, that only comes from only one street in Oviedo, Spain. Exactly. And you have been surprised we haven't talked about Aston Martin as to what they will do this year... Uh, at least with one of the drivers, what say you? Well, they're going to have to be competitive out of the box. Fernando's pushing. I think the whole team is behind it. And now they've finally settled in to their new facilities. It's been almost a year. So I think things are going to click. And Fernando is going to surprise Lando, Lewis, and Max. You know, I was looking at some website today. And there was a nice picture of Lawrence Stroll, Mrs. Stroll, and their two kids and it says you know the stroll family on uh, lance's uh, formula one debut everybody looking happy and all that and i just felt man this kid works so hard to get to formula one he deserves some success not just a pole position and a couple of podiums but yeah he has the same luck as uh, checo and gerhard berger he's got a teammate that is going to make life a little difficult Okay, sir, now we go to Back to the Future with IROC, International Race of Champions. Uh, do you remember the series from days gone by, or have you ever seen any of that action on YouTube? I remember the series. It wasn't really my bag or cup of tea, but very popular in America. Oh, yes, I love the series, especially the olden days, International Race of Champions was a very popular series which included Roger Penske as one of the founders. Back in the day, F1 drivers race against IndyCar and NASCAR drivers. All good things come to an end, and this series also became MH370 on the racing radar. Now, Ray Everham, who used to be crew chief of Jeff Gordon, has bought the rights to the name and planned to relaunch uh, the series. More motor racing, more happiness. And sir, speaking of crew chief, interesting thing, when I went to Miami Homestead, by the way, the go-kart track is located in a very nice area of um, what is called Miami Homestead. And I did a, a couple of interviews. Uh, one, it's so amazing, this kid I've met, he's very young, nine years old, and his father is uh, has Lebanese heritage, and he requested me, uh, please interview my son. So I said, okay, and I did, which we will play in the next few weeks and there is another you know i don't follow karting like i follow formula one but sometimes some names just when you watch they're on the top you know like nick de Vries was in karting he was what max is in motor racing today so last year all last year and so far this season the name cat keeps coming up is parker ives and his father greg uh, ives still works for hendrick motorsports but he was crew chief to jimmy johnson and has done, been in racing. He told me that uh, at one time, he is from Michigan originally, great, and he said at one time as a student or a teenager, he used to go and see Jimmy Johnson race uh, dirt races there, dirt tracks, and then he became his crew chief. So I had a nice chat with him. He invited me to his motor home, and we did an interview with Parker, which will also be coming soon. But one thing was very interesting. interesting. When I was leaving, you know, Jeff Gordon basically was with Hendrick Motorsports all his life, racing life in NASCAR. So I asked him, you know, would it be possible how to get in touch with Jeff Gordon? I mean, the guy was so cool. He said, yeah. I said, let me just text you. So he texted me the contact info for the PR guy for um, Hendrick Motorsports. And I'm a huge fan of Jeff Gordon, you know, so I will hopefully try to find a way to 
meet him and uh, I'm also seriously thinking of uh, making a trip to North Carolina. You know, I'd like to go to the visit a couple of the racing teams and do some interviews. And there are some very, very, very experienced racing personalities who took part at Le Mans with the Ford program. You know, names like Holman, Moody, Wood Brother. This means a lot to me, these names. One thing is leading to another. Like our next item, hands across the pond. I am very happy to say we are hoping to collaborate with Grand Prix 247.com. This is run by Mr. International, Paul Velasco, originally from South Africa of Portuguese background. Paul worked as a professional photographer in Formula One for Philip Morris. Today he is based in Berlin and we have a meeting set for February 29th at the Old Bank of Circuit and I told him I would do an interview with him while we are at the track and this is the track that held the 1959 uh, German Grand Prix. And up until I think 15-20 years ago they were doing DTM races there but I don't think uh, they're doing any races now but the, some of the infrastructure part of the Old Banking like the Monza Banking I think it's still there. So we will see how the meeting goes. Today we present their first contribution to F1 Weekly Podcast, a discussion between Paul and Grand Prix 247 men in Peru, Lebanon, Jad Malik. So I want to thank both of these gentlemen and hope our listeners enjoy this chit-chat between the two. What's happening? Well, nothing much. Nothing much. Your friend Ben Salaim is talking too much as usual. Still talking. Well, my friend, I think you have to be careful there. I mean, I worked with him. I mean, I like him. I like what he says. Honestly, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna knock the guy. I just don't see what he's saying that is wrong for the sport. I understand that it might not be what everyone wants to hear. Okay, I do understand that. I do understand it's like they don't want an eleventh team. They that the ten teams or nine teams. Don't want an extra team. And you've got to ask yourself this question. Really? How many teams are in Formula 1? There's three or four. Yeah. Okay? you got Mercedes. you got Ferrari. And you got Red Bull. Yeah. Okay? The other teams are satellite teams. They're second division teams. As long yeah. as... And this is... You know, to me, it's, it's a second division team. As long as you're not aligned to a manufacturer who's prepared to spend a lot of cash, like Audi are going to do, like uh, Andretti Cadillac will do, honestly... McLaren Mercedes, to me, is a B team because it's dependent on Mercedes to win the championship. Yeah, right. And I, 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 I speak, to, I stand to be corrected. Has any uh, non works team won a championship? Braun GP, I think, the latest. They drove but no, but yes, Braun GP was. They had a Mercedes engine on Yes, but Mercedes wasn't a team yet. Mercedes, Braun yeah. became. Yeah, but it was, yeah, but it was a non works team. They didn't have a works agreement because. Even Red Bull. Yes, I agree with you. They yeah, didn't have a yeah. works agreement, but they weren't they weren't the Silver Arrows. Yeah. The other team was McLaren. So the engine supplier said, Yeah, I'm Mercedes, the engine supplier. I've got only two teams. I make ten engines. I've en- I know exactly which one is good and bad. So I give both teams equal engines. But now if I'm Braun plus McLaren and there was a Mercedes team, guaranteed Braun wouldn't have won. Because Mercedes would have had the best kit. It's simple as that. I don't care what anybody says. Works teams cannot be beaten by suppliers. Look, well, unless I'm... it's an incredible anomaly. I'm saying to the title. I'm not saying what Mercedes yeah. did now. But at the end of the day, even with a bad car, a bad season, they still finished third or second or whatever Mercedes finished. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think Red Bull, Red Bull, when they were winning between 2010 and 2013, they had a Renault engine in that thing. And Renault were racing. They weren't Renault, but they had Lotus, I think, at at a point, and they had Renault at a point. So there are some ex- uh, there are some exceptions, I think. But I know where you're coming from. The problem, my, my problem with Bin Sulaim, I told you, he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk. He doesn't walk it. That's the problem. He talks the talk, and he walks his walk, and the people don't like the way he walks. I think that's fair. he does. He's doing a lot of walking, mate. You know, Nielsen went. He's got another guy. Look, I know, I know. I'm not talking internally. I'm talking in, ter- in terms of the sport. The latest thing, this thing with the with the wolf thing, the, the the investigation, that was that was plain stupid. The way that thing was handled, you don't go Listen, dude, and announce this. Absolutely, kind of... look, I'm not saying the guy's perfect, but he's well intended. And if you go and read our latest report on him, which was actually Motorsport Magazine did the interview, although he repeats himself a lot, says a lot of stuff that we ran in August. But yeah. anyway, so but there is some new stuff, and that new stuff is he says we make mistakes. 
and I'm the first to put up my hand when I make a mistake. I, I haven't really seen that yet, but let you see, he's putting a lot of sound bites out there that you can hold him accountable to, like transparency. Transparency in the FIA has been very, very important. You know, the Todd era was the opposite. It was like murky waters, you know, of everything. The conspiracy theories I've heard, the corruption, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to dig that up. I just got to say, I just, I'm impressed with what he's saying. I'm impressed with what uh, Mohammed Ben Suleim saying, and I think he does talk too much. He's too high profile, maybe. But hey, that's his style. I mean, w- w- why are we knocking it? I don't mind his style. I don't mind him being there every weekend. It's up to him. You know, at the end of the day, is that the business trips are not paid out of my pocket, but it's up to him to do that. But the problem is, for me, I'm worried if he's gonna see through what he's saying. It's gonna be a big year, mate. We have to see what what FOM and Andretti do. I can't believe they've taken this long. Eh? Everyone means that they're stalling. Yeah, it's been Salem's here to stay. And I'm going to say one thing. While it, a lot of the media are hitting, ah, oh, he's got to go. It's, first of all, it's racially motivated. I don't care what anybody says. Because it's an Emirati, people hate that fact. The fact that a non-European is running the FIA, I'm going to put it out there, is open to constant racial abuse. And if you go and look at the, some of the, the Facebook stuff, we deleted what they say about him. It's fucking bullshit. It's absolutely yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah, I so, know that. Yeah, I know that. And there's, there's a campaign to get rid of him on an ongoing basis, especially for the British media. They, obviously, the agenda is always with the teams. Mm. So I'm enjoying this breath of fresh air that he's bringing to me. I think it's the kind of job, it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. Let's move on. Yeah. Williams. Okay. Williams signing with Mercedes till 2030. That's just, for me, is such a lack of ambition. Because like I said, I don't believe that a works team like Mercedes, who have a team, who are fielding a team, are going to supply better engines. Logan Sargent's got a better piece of kit than than Lewis. (laughs) It's not going to happen. Sorry. It's just absolutely not going to happen. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. But I, I, I would use this logic with McLaren more than Williams. Williams, I don't think they have a choice now. In the condition they're, they're, they're in, I don't think Williams have a, have another choice now. I'm happy for them to see this, this to see this deal with Mercedes through, and after that we see where their chassis is. If they have a decent chassis and they stick with Mercedes, that's a big no-no. They have James Valves as their boss. Let's let's be tr- truly honest. This guy's roots are still with Mercedes. He's connected with them, and he's gonna get. Yeah, he's a mini Toto. He's like exactly. a little Toto. Exactly. He talks so much. Exactly. He's like, I think he'll. Put himself in a situation and, and he's buying himself five years, but he's actually got to go and knock on Porsche. He's got to knock on any big brand automaker that's not involved. I agree, and, but I think and, I think he needs to build some credibility first. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's a journey. Yeah. But as you said, McLaren was a very strange one. Until when is McLaren there? I think also 2030. I think so. I got the number. Beatings. They're also there up to 2030. 2030. It's a hell of a yeah. long time. Ford are coming in with Red Bull. So let's say Red Bull. They're coming in in 2026. Cadillac, if everything goes fine, they're coming in in 2028. Mm. And I think that might open up some rebadging. So 2030 yeah. might be a decent year for them because it would have been two years with a new Cadillac engine in the sport. They see that engine. Is it worth it? And then on 2030, when the deal's up, they look at it. Maybe, maybe up to then another another manufacturer comes in. I don't know. Hyundai? Maybe. But I think I think if anyone, if I'm an engine manufacturer and I want to go into F1 for now, my first choice now would be McLaren because they're the best non-works team out there for now. The one that did this very smart move was Mr. Lawrence Stroll signing up with Honda. That was a very absolutely, smart move. absolutely very yeah. smart. And very he beat smart. he beat Zach to it honestly. But I think maybe there's beat, too much bad. Yeah, blood. but there's history with, with there's McLaren. There's too much bad now. blood, yeah, because of the Alonso days. Okay, looking at the site now. Nothing really. I, I it's, think it's, uh, it's, th- it's the dead season, honestly. It's the dead season. Nothing is happening. That's why we've got to inject life into it. Yeah. Important. <clears throat> so that's our, this is our job this week. The week ahead is to inject life into the dormant season. It's time to wake up. It's time for the bullshits to start. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. that's what Formula One is, right? It's 99% bullshit and 1% racing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, if you think about it. And that, and and no other sport can actually compare on that level because you've got 20 guys, 10 teams, and the whole world focuses on it. And everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Formula One exposure doesn't compare to NBA. But, you know, NBA, you've got 30 teams or 20 teams with 
30 guys, you know, premiership. Yeah. yeah, it's one sport, 20 guys, 10 teams every single day. So, yeah, it's a bit of overkill, but it's time for them to – So, but, you know, I think the teams also could do slightly better in the off-season by just dropping some sound bites, you know, just interview – Anybody, they always interview the same people. Why don't I get an interview with the chief mechanic or the guy who just drives the trucks? You know, just say, "Ah, oh, what's your best race?" You know, just go. Let, you know, they talk about a thousand people in a team, but you only think there's four: the two drivers and the other guys who talk shit. You know, yeah, Toto exactly. and who else is in the team? You know, Toto and Toto and Lewis and George. Yeah, tell us yeah. about more people. Yeah, we know the other guy, the engineers. We've seen them. They talk so much. I mean, the Mercedes guys when they start talking, they don't stop. But the reality is, let's just hear from a secretary. Let's hear from a personal trainer. Let's hear from other people in the team. You know, McLaren, for instance. I don't know. I haven't seen it. They got this world record. I yeah. would have done a big poster with every single guy's name on it. Anyway, and I would. I'd love to interview a guy like that. How do you train? You know, do you have, even have a life? Do you, you know, if you fumble, what happens? How do you feel when you see Ferrari leave a wheel in the garage? Yeah, I'm hoping um, so I'm that, hoping 2024, Max, yeah, he's going to win it maybe, most probably, but let's hope he doesn't. No, most probably it's done. It's a done deal. Listen, it's a done deal unless there's a major wake-up call by the other two or three big teams. Uh, two teams. Ferrari and Mercedes have to come to the party this year. Honestly, bro, can you imagine writing... 24 headlines, Max Masterpiece, Max Alien, Max is on another level. You know, it's just, <laughs> you I do the, you do, Usually you do the race before, so that's your problem. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it's it comes a point where I don't know if Formula One can take another year of bloody um, Look, Max's, Max's uh, dominance. And at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because here we've got a guy playing at the highest, highest level, and I'm going to put it out there to put any driver in that car, Lando, Lewis, Fernando, no one can be. He'll whip them. He'll whip them because he's 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 in tune with the whole package. It's not like you're going to put Fernando in the other car and suddenly he's going to be up there with Max. No, he's going to crash a lot. And also, Max is just on a delivery level unseen before. Yeah, look, if you put if you put maybe Fernando or Lewis or Lando or these guys next to Max in the other car, okay, they're going to be better than Perez. Are they going to beat them? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think know so. they're going to be better than Perez. I, you know, Perez is, is is not a level of Fernando Lewis Norris driver, but you've got to remember one thing. The guy was unbelievably reliable. He never made mistakes. He was the track whisperer. Think back. This guy put the car where it never should have been, okay? But he just can't get the hang of this one because he's chasing. He's chasing Max. And to chase Max, I think David Terrian actually nailed it. Yeah. To beat Max... You got to do everything Max does better. Yeah, that's if he amazing. runs the setup pointy at the front, whatever, bomb, bomb, bomb. You got to run that setup and be a tenth quicker than him. Look, I think he, I think that's he needs to, ask. I think he needs to accept that he's just going to be a number two driver. Look, I think we, you wrote an article on Bottas saying that he's he spent five years in, at Mercedes in denial. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this yeah, is what's yeah, happening. He, he, with, this is what's happening with Checo. Five years at Mercedes, yeah, I'm going to win the championship. Mate, Lewis Hamilton's in the other car. Mm. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. <clears throat> it's a very tough one. I've always said, I think Perez got to accept his second best, but he's got to be glued to Max's bumper, like they're being towed. He's got to be Max Checo. And when che- Checo gets that kind of reliability where he can, even if he's if he drops 10 seconds back in a race, as long as he's behind Max, it doesn't matter, because there'll come times where he can... Maybe force an error. He's got yeah. it. Listen, the playbook was written in 2016 by Nico Rosberg. And that's the playbook he's got to look. You've got to look at every single race, got to read every single interview. These guys have got to do their homework, man. In the off season, he can't sit there on the beach, especially if you check a Perez. Max can do what he likes. You know what I mean? He can yeah. dazzle, you know, he can do whatever he wants. He can have a great time. But Checo has got to be every day spending three to four hours analyzing how uh, Nico beat Lewis. And he's got to analyze not not just the footage and stuff. He's got to watch those like he knows like a barber. But then he's got to look at the mind games. He's got to read all the reports. How did Nico get under Lewis's Lewis. skin? Yeah. Yeah. And then Max, he's got to take that to Max and go say, Max, hey, how are you doing, mate? It's cool. You're going to blow me this year. But bring out that ammunition that he learned over the winter. And I don't know if Checo's got it in him to do it. You know, you got to remember this. Nico did it. 
and could yeah. and he admitted he could only do it for one season. He could not sustain it. Exactly. So. Exactly. Anyhow, look, for me, for 2024, I think I'll put money on McLaren giving Red Bull a hard time. Not beating them, giving them a hard time. I think from where they finished 2023, if they keep doing what they've been doing, I think they're going to be the team that's going to take the fight to Red Bull, at least at the beginning of the year. Honestly, I have no trust in what Mercedes are going to do. They said they're going to change the car. They're not going to have the zero pods anymore. Okay, thank God. But then what? They said they're not going to follow even the... I think they said they're not going to follow the Red Bull way. So they're going to have their own concept. Look, okay. the bottom line says there's no certainty except one in Formula One this year is that that Red Bull and Max Verstappen are going to be as good as they were last year, if not better. That is the given. I'd say there's a good chance. 80, let's say, let's go mathematics. 80% chance that McLaren know that their car, how to progress their car, and they will be that thorn in the yeah. side that you're saying. With Aston Martin, it's 50-50, mate, because they don't really know where that car, where, what you can do to the car yeah, to make yeah, it quicker yeah. because they went backwards. So look, they, for instance, are the opposite of McLaren. So yeah, yes, look, 80% chance, 50% chance that Aston Martin get it. Because I'm not, I've got no faith in guys who spent a whole half season delivering parts that didn't work for Fernando and Lance. And then there, there could be an anomaly. I mean, Mercedes, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs. I expect them to be at Red Bull level. And I expect Ferrari to be at Red Bull level. Let's see. I don't Let's think see. they will be. I'm not, I'm, not sure. will be. I'm, not, I'm not sure they will. Look, for Aston Martin, in their defense, they had so much going on last year. You know, moving into the new factory, building the team. Look, if you get a set of, a set of employees, you know, and you move them from one office to the other, they're going to need at least a month to get used to their new environment, the location. How yeah, yeah, sure. So they were impressive. Yeah, I think I don't expect Aston Martin to do miracles maybe next year or the year after, but long term, and with that deal with Honda coming in in 2026. That was super shrewd. That's, that was that's again, that's smart. what makes Lawrence Stroll, Lawrence Stroll. He's basically building Aston Martin into a British version of Ferrari in a decade. Yeah, he just, and that's beautiful. Some hard, he just needs to do some hard parenting with Lance, maybe. When, yeah, well, that's cool. Keep Lance there until they get Honda. I think we've spoken enough, mate. You yeah. just don't stop speaking. You're worse than me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what happened when I worked with you for three years now. Gentlemen, thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. Very good, Nasser. Why don't we take a quick break, and we'll be back after these brief messages. Hi, I'm Carlos Sainz, and you are listening F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. And now, as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial and the king, the sultan himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, sir. As you know, Mr. Rogers, I was on the road Saturday, Sunday, and so I'm going to leave it up to you to give us an update on Dakar. Well, Dakar, very, very, very exciting. Now we're after the 48-hour chrono segment where Sebastian Loeb made some big progress. Science had a few issues. Let's hear from him right now. Still a long way for me. And a uh, long stages. And you, see, you, you can see how easy it is to lose five, ten minutes in this race. It's so easy. Navigation, punctures, everything. It's very stressful. And Carlos, on day 11, has taken back, now has a good five to six minute bumper between him and Sebastian Loeb. And everybody else is doing well. Unfortunately, we had an accident and uh, my condolences go out to his family. Carl Falcon of España uh, has passed in a crash in Dakar and it's devastating for everybody but these things do happen Nasser it's 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 sad but it is uh, pretty risky out there it it looks like it's just sand but so much can happen well that's very sad to hear I was not uh, aware of this and like I said I was mostly on the road but it's very sad to hear that now I'm sure you watch the Formula E race in Mexico where all your friends were from Pascal Verline to your favorite driver Nick De Vries no, I did not watch the race, but I heard uh, Pascal won, right? That's correct. It was on television, Nasser. CBS. Okay, so now we will move on to some uh, what's happening in the year 2024. Looks like we are off to a very good start uh, of the 2024 motor racing season. What is happening here 
when I went to Miami, uh, the go-kart race, I was looking at the name of drivers and one name caught my attention and that was uh, Bernardo Bernoldi. And a very, I had a very strong inkling that he is son of uh, Enrique Bernoldi. So I was able to uh, meet Bernardo. Uh, the family lives in Newport Beach, California these days. And he enthusiastically led me to his papito. Enrique Bernoldi, as we all know, is BFF of DC. And we had, he was very kind enough, you know, he agreed to um, interview at the last minute. We had a nice 20 minute chat, which will, we will share with F1 Weekly Familia next week. So please pass the gravy and the news, por favor. And sir, there's more good news which I got today, and you saw it before I did. Totally elated to say, Friday I have a 10 minute appointment with Felipe Baby at Daytona. He's driving for Riley Motorsports, and I'm very thankful for uh, their PR people to respond to me quickly and confirm this, so I'm very, very happy. And you know, Felipe, I've been following his career before he... Um, do you remember when he was um, at Sauber before Ferrari? Of course, Nasser. Yeah, he was pretty wild in those days. And I, I remember thinking at one time I was watching the race with my racing buddies and race start and he was barrel rolling or going at high speed off the track. And we were wondering, you know, this guy can make it in Formula One. But he made it to Ferrari and was world champion for 15 seconds. And he may be world champion once again. So we will uh, see how this thing works out. Extra shrimp on the barbie is placed by our mate in Land Down Under, the original JB, Jason Bentley. I'm a little, uh, not jet lag, but road lag, so excuse moi. So, and Mr. Jason Bentley is very kindly putting together L Plan, just like Rossi at uh, Alpine. He's putting out a Aussie L Plan, which would include visiting Mount Panorama Circuit, where the Bathurst 1000 takes place. And there is the wonderful Museum of Australian Motor Racing, uh, which I'm really looking forward to, especially Jack Brabham's car. We will also make a very emotional trip to Longford Street Circuit in Tasmania, where Timmy Mayer was killed in 1964 uh, during a Tasman series race. And he was, of course, brother of Teddy Mayer of McLaren fame. And you know, this situation about Timmy Mayer killed in 1964, this is something just like uh, reading about Antonio Ascari getting killed at uh, Moaleri. Uh, this I read, I mean, basically even before I got interested in Formula One. So it, these uh, events of history have are embedded in my mind. So I'm really looking forward to going to Longford in Tasmania with JEP. So thank you for all your help. And a shout out to Miss Katrina also, probably in Perth right now. But we shall meet soon in Albert Park. So this is hopefully will be a very good trip. And sir, we now come to uh, new car launches. February 7, Alpine. February 14, Mercedes. February 15, Red Bull. Now we've talked about Mercedes, Red Bull quite a bit. Um, what say you about Alpine? Alpine will be struggling. They're still a mess. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, I don't even think they have the leadership that I was expecting that they would have. So, honestly, Renault is a big question mark. I am just hoping. You know, this news about Michael Andretti's team uh, has gone quiet. I just hope that maybe there's an opportunity with Alpine selling out or uh, Gene Haas saying no mass. But uh, it's, um, I mean, we've said this many times. We don't want to repeat that this is ridiculous. But this uh, resistance he's facing to be the 11th team is absolutely mind-boggling. And uh, I don't know how it will work out. Last thing we need is a lawsuit or European Union legal department getting involved. So that won't be good for Formula One. What say you, amigo? Well, they get in or they don't. Uh, I'm tired of the bickering. I think Mohamed Sulayem is pro-Andretti. And I think your biggest hurdles are Christian Horner and Toto Wolf, who yield a lot of power in their little magic wand. You know, what really surprises me, Stefano Domenicali is Paisan to Mario Andretti. Even he's not interested. It's, it's you know, it's, it's Benjamins. They're bitching and mourning about Monza. Monza has now just embarked on a, a repaving and modernization of the facilities. Don't think the local government has the money they have in oil-rich countries, so... Uh, 
Can you imagine taking the race from Monza and giving it to Angola just because they can pay $45 million fee and my favorite 5% annual increase automatically and you must sign a five-year contract. We have beaten this, not a prancing, but a corrupt horse to death. Lewis Hamilton would like to see a race in Angola because South Africa is not going to come up. According to Jody Schechter, uh, South Africa came very close to, but then, then what he claimed was greed of the local promoter um, dropped the idea. The Kayanami circuit is very historical, very famous, very good circuit. I love, you know, it comes down right at the start. I really, really like that place very much. I would love to see a Grand Prix there. You know, some years ago, Kayanami circuit was bought out by Porsche. And they did most of the improvement, but I am not sure if they still own the circuit or not. But I would much rather see a race in uh, streets of uh, Mar del Plata or Buenos Aires in Argentina, or even there's no shortage of racing tracks in Argentina. I would love to see a race in Land of Fangio before we go to some Fiji or some other place. Now, sir, Formula One is not going to any vintage tracks. Everything has to be new like Vegas, Miami. Yeah, we're not going to uh, to South Africa. Porsche does own it, but they're not going to pour $50 million to bring it up to Formula One spec. They're going to ask the community, and the community in South Africa will not pay those kinds of sums of money. It's just not going to happen. So if we go to Argentina, we're going to have to have something special in the streets with mega everything. So Formula One is a whole new beast. It's mega, it's Americanized, it's Taylor Swift, all wrapped up into a big ball. I'm waiting for my check on that one, Nasser. Listen, folks, it's 2024. There ain't going to be that big changes. The biggest changes are going to be at Mercedes because they really had to revamp everything. But even Allison doesn't like the stiff cars of this particular Formula One era. As soon as we get to 2026, the better for everybody In the long run, I think that's the big chance to beat Red Bull. So everybody, get your camping chairs out, get your Fernando hats on, and just enjoy the ride. Hopefully, we'll get an Aston Martin win. But besides that, it's Max all over again, folks. Yes, and I'll tell you, if Mercedes does not have a competitive car this year, this is basically last chance alone for Lewis Hamilton. And as much as I would like to see him get number eight, I think if, if this this is the season. If they don't provide him, then it's just uh, over. What I'm thinking for your sake and you know, for health's sake is that when Honda goes to Aston Martin, they can be the winning package. And then wouldn't it be nice if Fernando Alonso becomes a world champion at uh, 49 or 50 years old? It would be screaming Formula One engine at Suzuka. Yes, and I'm going to say this. I mean, he has won quite a few races already. If and ever he wins a race with Aston Martin, it's going to be as popular a win as it was for Gerhard Berger when he got his first win, or Monsieur Jean Alessi, where everybody was genuinely happy for him. Lewis and him, I think, are good friends, which is interesting. They have a lot of respect for each other despite their battles on track. And same goes between Lewis and uh, Sebastian Vettel. Absolutely. Are you going to Daytona? Well, I'm going to the qualifying Friday and Saturday. I have to see if I will go to the race. I would like to, but we'll see how it works out. Well, keep up the good work, Nass. Another outstanding job. Keep getting those interviews. You may run into Brad Pitt when you're at Daytona. Apparently, he is desperate to keep filming. He'll take any track. You might even see him at Martinsville. I want to thank everybody who listens, who contributes, who helps us sustain this long journey in keeping everybody in the need for F1 and other motorsports information. So we're going to keep doing it. You guys keep doing it. And we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.